Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The Work Landscape During COVID-19, What Does Normalcy Resemble? Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You have joined the presentation and listening using your computer speaker system by default. If you prefer to join over the telephone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial in information will be displayed. You have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them at the end of the presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded and you'll receive a follow up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view the recording. And now I'd like to introduce Peter Guattari, Jen Jackman, and Tiffany Relliford, partners at Whiteford, Taylor, and Preston. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Tiffany Relliford. I'm going to start off our presentation today. Um, just another note to add, um, you are free to ask questions uh, as we go through the presentation. Depending on, on time, we will try to address them as we do the presentation. Um, if we get too many questions um, in the essence of time, we may wait and address them at the end. So rolling into it, um, just to give you a little bit of a roadmap as to what we're going to cover today, the first thing is we're going to briefly recap the new legislation in current guidance with relation to COVID. We're going to talk about EEOC compliance and ADA concerns. We're also going to address safety compliance under OSHA and the CDC guidance. Then we're going to get into remote working and best practices to be considering during this time, as well as mitigating risk. So that's just a little uh, roadmap of what we're going to cover today. So to start off, let's talk about the new federal laws to address COVID-19. And I guess new in that they came out in April. Um, most of us are aware of them by now, but in case you aren't, uh, the president signed the Families First Coronavirus Response Act on March 18, 2020, but the law became effective on April 1, 2020, and it expires on December 31st of 2020. One of the main purposes of the law is to mitigate economic harm to individuals and families due to COVID-19. So in that um, respect, the law has two parts. The first part is the Emergency Family Medical Leave and Expansion Act, or EFMLEA, and the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act, which is EPSLA. That's gonna, how I'm going to refer to it kind of vaguely throughout the uh, presentation. So what is the story under these new laws? Again, this is just to briefly recap. We're not going to do a deep dive into this, um, but the amount of leave that or paid leave that's provided to an employee is going to depend on the reason for which they're taking the leave under the FFCRA. A person will get 100% pay for two weeks if the reason is for numbers one through three, but that's going to be maxed out at $511 per day. Again, reason one would be they're subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order related to COVID-19. This is not the same as stay-at-home orders that have been issued by many different jurisdictions. This would be an order that is specific to the individual. Uh, the individual has been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine related to COVID-19, or reason three, they're experiencing COVID-19 symptoms and they're seeking a medical diagnosis. So for those first three reasons, you be paid leave at 100% of the regular pay for two weeks. If it's for reasons four through six, it's 66% of the pay, and again, that's maxed out at $200 a day. Um, those reasons would be they're caring for an in individual that's subject to an order um, set forth in the first reason or, is just, or an individual who's on self-quarantine as set forth in number two, um, or they're caring for their child whose school or place of care is closed or their child care provider is unavailable uh, due to COVID-19 related reasons. Again, that, that reason, number five, is going to fall under not only the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act, but also the Family Medical Leave Expansion Act. Or, or six, they're experiencing any other substantially similar conditions specified by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I'm sorry. So if it's, if it's for reasons four through six, it's 66%. Um, if it's for reason five specifically, especially when we're talking about the Family Medical Leave Expansion Act, 
Again, it's 66%, but the 66% is only for 10 weeks. Um, under the Family Medical Leave Expansion Act, it is 12 weeks of leave, but the first two weeks are unpaid. So it would be 66% for those remaining 10 weeks. Just um, to briefly also recap, uh, the PPP loans are another big topic um, that has come up in uh, legislation that has come out of this pandemic. So a lot of employers have applied for and or received PPP loans. And one of the questions that we frequently get is, the interplay between unemployment and those PPP loans. So let's just take this hypothetical, for example. Um, ABC just got their PPP loan. They want to recall their furloughed staff. Joy is getting unemployment, and it is higher than her compensation before the furlough. ABC called Joy with the joyous news that she can come back to work. Shockingly, she was not particularly joyful and declined the offer. So what is the employer supposed to do next? Well, there is a new exemption from the Treasury that addresses this issue. And what it says is that if the employee rejects your reemployment offer, you may be allowed to exclude this employee when calculating forgiveness uh, pursuant to your PPP loan. But to qualify for the exemption, the employer needs to document some things. One, you must have documentation of the employee's rejection of the offer. You must have offered to rehire for the same salary or wage and or number of hours as they were before they were laid off. And you must have made a written offer to rehire in good faith. So if an employer is gonna take advantage of that exemption, they need to make sure that they are documenting um, all of these things. So that's just a brief recap of kind of the federal laws uh, that came into the landscape as it relates to COVID. And now I'm gonna pass it off to Peter to talk more about the EEOC compliance, ADA, and OSHA and CDC. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, I'm gonna cover some, some guidance, um, and we're talking here about guidance, not uh, formal regulations um, with respect to, to the applicable law, but we're gonna cover both the EEOC, OSHA, and the CDC guidance, all of which are going to be relevant to the actions that you're going to be taking with respect to your employees and your workplace in order to make sure that it's safe for employees and uh, members of the public if they come into your workplace uh, when, you, when you start to reopen. Um, some of you may have minimal operations now and you're, may, you're taking these, these um, steps. So from, from the EEOC standpoint, and let, let me just say at the outset, the EEOC, OSHA, and the CDC have websites which are dedicated to compliance issues under the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. You should absolutely look at these resources. Uh, I cannot possibly, in the time I have, summarize all of them, but I'm going to cover some high points for you. So from an ADA compliance standpoint, um, you have a number of uh, questions that come up, particularly in the context of employees who have pre-existing conditions or disabilities that might put them particularly at risk with respect to uh, COVID-19. Some employees may be taking leave uh, because of a condition and need additional time. You're going to need to understand uh, the particular uh, situation of the individual and make a determination within the guidelines uh, as to whether this constitutes a disability, it relates to an existing condition or disability, and take steps as necessary to uh, to treat those employees in a in a manner consistent with the ADA, which generally requires some type of interactive process. You want to avoid treating employees' difficulty based on the perception of disability due to COVID-19, but you also don't want to treat employees with pre-existing conditions that put them at risk in a position where they're not able to enjoy the full benefit of, of a return to work um, that they might want to do. This means imposing limits on their ability to return to work without actually having examined the extent to which a risk exists and to which extent that risk can be mitigated and allow them to return to work. Um, so there are a wide variety of issues that are to be considered here in the context of ADA compliance, pre-existing conditions and disability, and people at risk from COVID-19. Um, it's an entire webinar unto its own, but again, the EEOC, 
uh, guidance on this is, is quite helpful and I, I recommend you to take it. Taking temperatures at work is generally considered a medical examination and from the EEO's standpoint, EEOC standpoint, taking temperature is a permissible quote unquote medical examination at this point in time given the unique circumstances of the pandemic. The EEOC has also indicated that employers may take test, tests and may also uh, inquire as to employees and prospective employees as to whether they are exhibiting any symptoms of a COVID-19 infection. These would typically be viewed as medical examinations and in requests for information, but due to the current situation and the need to um, limit exposure, the EEOC is indicating that these types of ac actions and questions are permissible. Um, so if an employee were to call in sick, you can ask them directly whether they are exhibiting symptoms of COVID-19. And there are specific symptoms which are identified on the CDC website. They go beyond simply temperature to include headaches, sore throats, vomiting, diarrhea, um, general fatigue and muscle aches. Um, and in many cases, some of these symptoms may not be present at all. And in some cases, none of these symptoms may be present, which makes it particularly difficult. However, you are at liberty to ask these questions of employees uh, if they call in sick. Um, are you still in, obligated to engage in the interactive process? Yes, certainly. That hasn't been suspended and the EEOC has made clear they're still enforcing laws during the pandemic, even though they may not necessarily be around um, in their offices to uh, to uh, to uh, actively accept and intake claims, they will take them online and they will be processing those claims. Um, and you can also ask employees about what accommodations they may need. In fact, um, the interactive process is designed to focus on uh, what types of accommodations are reasonable, what might put an undue burden on an employer, and uh, how you can mitigate risk, particularly risk to employees who have conditions which may put them in enhanced risk of, of uh, death or serious illness as a result of uh, COVID-19. I always uh, tell this, and another thing here which you need to be aware of is also age as an issue. Um, generally, the focus is let's not necessarily go to those employees and tell them this is what we think we're going to do for them, but educate your employees as to the risk factors and allow them to come and seek uh, accommodations as necessary, engage in the interactive process, and explore what can be a reasonable accommodation in the workplace. Um, the old factors of additional leave, um, restructured workplaces, et cetera, remain uh, effective uh, reasonable accommodations. So let's shift from the EEOC. As I said, there's much there's much more there that I haven't covered, but I want to at least acquaint you to the issues and direct you to their website. And we're going to shift gears and we're going to focus on OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health, Health Administration. The law, which has been in effect for uh, since the 70s, uh, imposes uh, a general duty on employers to maintain a safe place of employment which is in free which is free from recognized hazards that are causing harm or likely to cause death and serious physical harm now anyone who's who's experienced has experience with OSHA knows that there are detailed regulations playing a variety of safety standards and these include PPE standards uh, and the specific identification of um, specific identification of uh, types of activities in which PPE might be required, and activities in which uh, there are safety risks and types of steps that might be taken to reduce the risk. COVID-19 presents a particularly um, uh, difficult situation in the context of, of OSHA safety because, uh, as I said earlier, long incubation period, it's difficult to identify uh, whether 
people are, can be infected even when they are spreading. And so uh, OSHA has taken an approach to this uh, in conjunction with the CDC in issuing some general guidance as to what they expect employers to do and how to, how to do that work. Keep in mind that in order to support a citation of your workplace, OSHA has to show a hazard that's a recognized hazard likely to cause serious harm or death, and the hazard um, must be correctable, feasible means to eliminate and reduce the hazard. <coughs> Um, so, from another issue that comes up in the context of OSHA is recording and requirements. And this is important, particularly if you're beginning to see cases of COVID-19 in your workplace. Um, and I'm going to be uh, some interim guidance that has been issued by OSHA with respect to um, with respect to recording and reporting requirements of, of OSHA. Uh, most of you uh, who are familiar with industrial processes are aware of OSHA reporting forms. Uh, even in the workplace, uh, an office workplace, you're gonna have forms 300 and 300A, which relate to the reporting of uh, workplace illnesses that are illnesses that are work-related. Um, and the annual report that is reported number 301 uh, or, or form number 301 and these reports need to be maintained if there is uh, and, and, and to indicate work-related illnesses uh, as they occur. Um, the death of an employee due to a workplace injury, and I apologize for the misspelling of do there, has to be promptly reported according to OSHA guidelines. In fact, the guidelines, the, the regulations specify within eight hours of the occurrence and failure to do so can result in stiff penalties. So the question now has come up, well, how do you determine an, whether an illness or injury is work-related, particularly with respect to COVID's long incubation period? And uh, so the, could you go to the next slide, please? So a condition is work-related if an event or exposure in the work environment either caused or contributed to the resulting condition or significantly abrogated a pre-existing injury or illness. Work-relatedness is going to be presumed for injuries or illnesses revol resulting from events or exposures occurring in the work environment unless an exception is going to imply. Um, that's the general standard. However, in interim guidance issued on April 10th, OSHA clarified for the employers who are not in the healthcare industry, emergency response, and correctional institutions, a temporary standard is going to apply. And that temporary standard uh, is, as they said in their notice, is until further notice, OSHA will not enforce and that's a specific regulation to reporting, to require employers to make same work-related misdeterminations, except where there is objective evidence that a COVID-19 case may be work-related. For example, a number of cases developing among workers who work closely together without an alternative explanation, and the evidence was reasonably available to the employer. And it gives some information with respect to what may be reasonably available to the employer. Um, to give you an example, if you're, if you're an employer and you have employees who are working in a grocery store and you have a spate of infections within one particular department, you may, uh, you may therefore be in a position under these re regulations to, to note that this has to be reported. It has to be recorded, and if there is a death, that death has to be recorded. Take into consideration the fact that when there is when there is uh, a co positive COVID test in most, if not all states, it's being reported to the Department of Health. The Department of Health is going to know, and the Department of Health may well visit your facility if they see a, a cluster of cases uh, arising in, in your facility. And that may also precipitate an OSHA inspection. Um, so it is best to be proactive here from um, avoiding a citation 
uh, avoiding an ins a serious inspection that could relate in significant relate result in significant fines to take steps ahead of it. You don't necessarily need to admit that it's due to a problem in your facility, but at least uh, re record it and and then take steps to protect yourself that it's out of out of extreme abundance of caution. Um, the next slide is going to give you what is OSHA's guidance for a number of different industries. If you look at their website, they have uh, guidance for nursing homes, retail pharmacies, rideshare, dental practitioners, et cetera. They have a, a general guidance for preparing workplaces for COVID-19, which is a very helpful PDF, which I encourage you to print, and also for understanding the level of an exposure of risk in the workplace. And I say this because the level of exposure of risk in the workplace is um, perhaps uh, one of the more important factors for determining to what extent um, to what extent uh, you have to take certain precautions, uh, safety steps recommended by the CDC. So OSHA specifically recommends that all employers assess their risk levels. How, where, and from what could workers be exposed? What are the occupational and non-occupational risk factors? What basic infection control measures can we implement? Engineering, administrative, PPE, safe work practices. And how can we develop prompt identification and isolation of sick employees and communicate with those employees our policies? Education here is going to be one of your first tools of defense, particularly as it relates to minimizing these risks. Much of the OSHA guidance refers to the CDC guidelines, and the, the uh, OSHA or CDC has issued interim guidance for businesses and employers responding to COVID-19. Again, as I said earlier, this is being updated regularly. It was last updated last week. It is a very extensive document, and it has a lot of information and recommendations that takes you through steps you can do as an employer to make your workplace safe and um, you should consider these two requirements as working in tandem. You make a risk assessment, look at the suggestions from the CDC for how you mitigate these risks. So what is it that you're going to be doing? Conduct your hazard assessment. What type of engineering and administrative controls may mitigate risks? Engineering controls are how your workflows force moves, the hallways, the movements around, where furniture and things are structured, who uses what equipment and how. Uh, these are all things that you should look at. Um, not all controls are going to reduce risk or be fully protective, so therefore you might need to institute the use of PPE where appropriate. You're going to encourage face coverings even if PPE is not required, and you're going to train employees and remind them of CDC recommendations. You're going to separate out sick employees and follow the guidance on sick employees to returning to work. There are very specific guidelines in the CDC about the time frames for returning to work. And you're going to in implement and follow cleaning and disinfecting protocols on a regular basis. Um, more issues is, as I said, educating employees on the risks of transmission in and out of the workplace. Implement flexible leave and support policies. Consider flexible work arrangements. You can stagger your workforces. You can have some employees work at home. It will reduce the number of employees in the workplace and reduce the risks. You can assess essential functions and maintaining operations if employee absenteeism spikes. And you can take steps to protect employees at high risk and other factors such as social distancing, promoting use of hand cleaners, disinfectant, etc. Again, these are all taken from the CDC guidance and you're going to need to understand these protocols and know them in advance um, in order to create your plan and how you're going to go back to work safely so that you have uh, employees who are safe and taken care of. Um, and I'll come finally to um, worker complaints of unsafe work practices. OSHA itself has a, the law has a specific non-retaliation for provision for reporting unsafe work practices. There are multiple other laws which may provide this protection of 
as well under state law. There may also be potential wrongful discharge claims if that is not the case based on a public policy. You need to be very careful about how you address complaints about unsafe workplaces. This means, of course, that you've taken the steps to get to know the, uh, the, the guidance and that you're able to educate employees and have them understand what steps you've taken and why it is keeping them safe. Um, because taking action against an employee if they refuse to work or believe in good faith that there's a danger um, or that there's insufficient time to eliminate that danger could result in a retaliation claim and that is not exactly where you want to be. I apologize for going through that quickly. However, we have limited time. Those are very detailed topics. And I'm going to now switch over to, I believe, Jen is going to take this up. Thanks, Peter. So we're going to move on to remote working challenges and best practices in this COVID environment. Um, and understanding what Peter had just mentioned, that the guidance is saying you want to make sure you're having flexible workplaces, which may include still remote working, even when we're cleared to go back. So how are we going to do this with all the juggling going on? Well, as you've probably been doing and you want to continue to do, you want to make sure you're communicating your expectations to your employees. What are the hours of work that you're expecting? Um, the productivity you're expecting and timeliness understanding that some of them are facing incredible hardships with no child care and young children at home. So working with them to make sure you're taking advantage of the leave that Tiffany discussed earlier if they need it. Um, communicating that this is temporary if it is, and we'll talk soon about why that's important. But if you haven't already communicated that to your staff, unless your business is going to make the change to permanent remote status, you wanna make sure that you're putting in writing and documenting that this is a temporary accommodation for, uh, for the COVID pandemic. Um, and also requirements for safety at home. I think some people are security at home are forgetting that um, while we had all these requirements in the workplace, especially with employee files under lock and key, we need to make sure we're having those same standards at home. So making sure staff has security on their um, laptops, um, on their printers that their files are closed and inaccessible to others and locked up if it's proprietary and sensitive information. And managing expectations about how long this is going to last and um, making sure people understand that. Everyone's very insecure right now as to when they're gonna have to return to work. But think about the Twitter announcement that just came out saying that no one ever has to return to work. Is that exciting expectations for the rest of the workforce? It shouldn't be, but understand where your workforce is coming for, from, and make sure you're really clearly communicating when you think you'll be able to go back to the, uh, to the office. But even as I said, even though we will be going back to work, teleworking will likely still be in place for quite some time. Um, and so to that end, you wanna have some considerations that you're uh, thinking about for telework. Do you have a formal telework policy in place? If you don't, you should get one, even if you're only gonna have it as a temporary arrangement that explains what your expectations are. If you don't have a formal policy, now's the time to do it, and maybe even have your staff sign an agreement about that. How are you and your managers going to measure performance while working from home, understanding again that people are facing different challenges than before? Um, collaboration is going to potentially be strained, but making sure that you still have high expectations, but maybe you are relaxing some of those standards. How are you facilitating collaboration and teamwork from working from home? How are you holding meetings? Um, one thing we've been seeing a lot of is like Zoom meetings and all these new platforms, but Zoom has had some security issues. So if you're talking with your staff about anything that could be privileged or proprietary, Zoom may not be the right platform for you. And before you hold any meeting um, electronically, the, you know, we recommend that you at least announce who's supposed to be on it and that it's not intended to be recorded unless, of course, it is. Are you requiring participation by video and how does that affect the morale? Some staff may in enjoy having the interaction, the more human aspect of it, while others who are juggling many different responsibilities now may actually think that's even more of a hardship. So being understanding of those different challenges and figuring out what's best for your workforce. Other challenges you're going to face, let's talk a little bit about this hypo. So 
Like many, Doug is now working from home. Doug has an infant and a three-year-old, and Doug's spouse is an ER doctor working overtime and unable to help much during the day with the kids. Doug is struggling and trying to keep up with the work, but you notice that he really is not as productive as he once was. In the past, he was one of your highest performers. What do you do? Well, the first thing we would say is talk to Doug. Don't let problems fester. And understanding you want to be flexible, you do need, do need to communicate if he's not meeting the expectations um, and document it. Maybe you need to talk to Doug about whether he needs to take advantage of that leave if he hasn't already under the Expanded Family Leave Act. Um, does he need a reduced schedule, intermittent leave? But, you know, really engage in an interactive process with him, especially since he was one of your highest performers. So you, you know, you support him in this time, but he's also providing value to your company um, in the way you need. So now once it's over, once we find out, we get an order saying we can return, we want to go back, or you hear everyone saying, I want to go back to work, what are you going to do? Well, you want to say not so fast. There's so many requirements, and, and Peter just did an excellent job going through all of them. Um, there's no hard and fast rule currently issued by the state or federal government. Um, as Peter went through, CDC guidance is your best source on, in, in, on information on mitigating risks to your business and your employees, and we'll talk later about documenting that. But you do need to make sure your company is prepared to reopen and mitigate against possible claims if there is um, COVID outbreak in the workplace. Um, talk a little bit, another hypo, we've got another return to work issue. So we've got the governor has announced, and this is fake, he hasn't really yet, but let's say the governor announced the stay at home order has ended and businesses can start going back to work. In the same announcement, the governor recommends that employers should be flexible with employees when it comes to returning to work. Ted, um, Oscar is over 60 and has a compromised immune system. Oscar asks if he can continue to work from home rather than return to the work because he's really afraid of contracting COVID. What do you do? Well, here you would engage in that interactive uh, process. If he has a compromised immune system, chances are he uh, is covered by the ADA. And so what you, my first re recommendation would be is that you say, how can we help you? And if he says he wants to work from home, you would say, okay, well, we need something from the doctor showing that this is their recommendation. What if Oscar can't provide that, but he's telling you that he really is concerned about his safety? You also want to look at Oscar's job. Can he continue to perform it from home effectively? If he can, our recommendation would be to be flexible and allow him that, that accommodation. What about Beth, who has two kids under age 10 and camp was canceled for the summer, but now we're being told she can come back to work? She still does not have childcare and wants to continue working from home. What do you do? Again, the first thing to revisit is, can she continue to effectively perform the essential functions of her job from home? And if so, maybe you wanna to talk to her about the leave under the FFCRA if she hasn't already taken that. Um, and if she has, can you continue to extend her that flexibility? Because we are being told as employers to continue to be flexible. Um, so if she can do the job from home and um, and she's out of leave, consider allowing her to. Otherwise, um, consider offering her that leave if she still has it or making that um, option available to her. How about Ted? Ted has no pre-existing conditions but is scared to come back. What do you do? He's got no um, no ADA concerns. He really just doesn't want to come back. Unfortunately, Ted is out of luck. I mean, unless he really can continue performing work and you're letting all employees voluntarily choose who comes back and who doesn't, if the expectation is that he returns to the office and he's only he's just not returning because he's afraid, he needs to come back or he could potentially lose his job. Um, returning to work issues, let's talk about your office is reopening, but as an organization, you have decided to stagger who returns initially and who works from home. Betsy and Grace have the same position. Betsy is 65. Grace is 30. You only need one person to return to the office right now and the other one can telework. Can you affirmatively select Grace over Betsy in order to quote unquote protect Betsy? And Peter touched about this uh, on this with the ADA and EEOC. No, the answer is no. You can't make that decision because now you might be regarding her as disabled, which is a whole category of discrimination. Um, what if Betsy is immunocompromised? Um, so for the first one, it would have been an age discrimination issue, but if she actually has a disability, you still can't make that decision for her. 
Um, direct threat is a high standard, but if Betsy requests to stay at home, I would allow it. You just can't force that decision um, upon it. So in that situation, when you have only one person that needs to come back and more people in that role, um, you could either stagger the shifts or you could ask for volunteers. There's a myriad of ways that we can deal with this moving forward, but you should not make decisions um, as to who can return to the workforce based on age or disability or assumed um, protected status. I'm now gonna kick it over to Tiffany to talk about mitigating risk when you reopen. So let's look at um, what should you do to mitigate some of those risks that an employer may face with regard to reopening. Um, the first thing is establish a return to work task force. You know, this can be comprised of your legal team, HR, managers, but you want to have a good task force representative of many different um, the departments in your workforce in order to start to address uh, some of these issues that you may face. The key to having a task force is to also have one or two people that control the messaging to the staff to maintain consistency. Um, the worst thing is to have many different people saying different things um, so that the message is unclear to staff or staff is confused. You want to make sure that you're controlling that message. Understanding that people already have a heightened level of anxiety because we're in an unprecedented time, um, controlling the messaging is going to help alleviate some of that anxiety. I cannot reiterate enough what both Jen and Peter have already said, that you need to develop a plan. And in developing a plan, look to OSHA and CDC for guidance. Those are your two best sources of information. You need to rely on the thorough um, and daily guidance that they are putting out to help guide you through this process. Also make sure that you consider in this day and age where social media, uh, Twitter, Facebook, all those social platforms are very, very popular that you consider that anything you send out could go viral. So be careful in how you are stating your messages and sending your communications to your employees. You never know when somebody may repost something on some social media platform. Other things you should consider. When you open your redoors, um, consider hosting 15 to 20 minute reopening orientations for employees. What this, would be do, what this would do is you would discuss for them some of the new norms and processes and procedures in the office. Talk about what are the changes that you made to protect employees. Um, the process to report if the employee tests positive. What is the process you put in place if a guest or a vendor tests positive, assuming that you're still letting them into your office, and we'll talk about that later. But the key thing here is that you want to establish communication that will help reduce anxiety and stress in the workplace because many people already have heightened levels of anxiety and stress um, just due to this pandemic and the fact that we have been at home um, and you know the fear of contracting it. So to help ease that, consider having these orientations with your staff where you can control the messaging and ad address questions um, all in one setting. Other safety considerations to keep in place. Make sure that you're ensuring proper social distancing. It may require remodeling spaces and cubbies to make sure that you can get that six feet of distance. Uh, as Peter and Jen have both mentioned before, staggered shifts are something that you need to consider um, when you reopen your doors. If possible, limit elevator capacity. You know, if you're in a building where you're renting space, talk to the building management about what are they going to do about the elevators and are they going to limit capacity in the elevators. HVAC systems, you know, check with your building owner. How are they handling uh, air filtration or how often are they replacing the air filters? Those are things that you may want to know. Restricting bathroom capacity to make sure that we don't have too many people in a space at a small time. And thinking about putting touchless surfaces in your office. That's another way to minimize transmission of the virus. So take that into consideration. Other things you can take into consideration, making sure the employees understand that if I have a workstation, that is my workstation. I shouldn't be sharing phones, keyboards, my mouse, my pens, et cetera, with other people. You know, you keep your own property and your own workstation. You may want to consider um, if you're an office like ours where we use, we have glass products, we have uh, coffee mugs, things of that nature that are cleaned on a routine basis, maybe you need to consider replacing those with pr uh, paper products um, for some temporary period of time. Likewise, uh, if you have a busy office with a lot of people, 
you know, do you need to put signs and arrows throughout the office to direct employees on their movement and spacing to minimize direct contact and also help manage that social distancing aspect? Um, that's another consideration that you can take into place. So in addition to those just general considerations, there are other things that an employer should consider with regard to infection control. And Peter and Jen both mentioned a lot of this earlier, but we're just going to reiterate some of these things. Um, you want to have enhanced cleaning standards. Again, CDC is going to be your best source of guidance for this. Uh, put sanitation stations in your office if you didn't already have them, and maybe if you did have them, you need to consider adding more. Uh, face coverings and PPE, uh, talk about that. You know, if it's a requirement, who's going to provide them? Where are we getting them from? Uh, keep that in mind. Peter mentioned taking temperatures of employees or testing for COVID-19, knowing, you know, the pitfalls for that. Again, the EEOC says it's fine, but really should you? Uh, it's, a lot of it's going to depend on your workforce and where you are and other factors that may come into place, but that's a consideration that you need to keep in mind. Making sure, again, you have clear reporting channels for, COVID, for employees with COVID symptoms. But in that vein, you need to make sure that you're also preserving confidentiality. You know, here, as Peter mentioned before, and as Jen mentioned, we get into medical issues with regard to disabilities or just medical information in general. Um, and before COVID, HR professionals know that you have to keep those things separate. You can't have medical information um, in the same place as, you know, W-2s and all those other things. So you need to make sure that you are doing what you need to do to preserve confidentiality. Jen mentioned this before, if you're working from home, you need to make sure that you are locking up those confidential documents, that they're not just sitting out on your desk somewhere so that if somebody comes by, they see them. Um, make sure that you put measures into place to control confidentiality. Consider contract tracing. There are many options out there that are being developed, but if you look into this, you also need to be mindful of privacy concerns with regard to contract tracing. You know, if an employee becomes infected, yes, we have an obligation to disclose it, but not to disclose the person's name and to be careful about disclosing any information by which the person um, that could identify the person without even disclosing their name. So you need to be mindful of those concerns. Consider limiting visitors in the work site or not allowing visitors at all. Again, this is going to depend on the nature of your business, but it's something you want to uh, think about, as well as putting limits on non-essential non uh, travel, making sure that employees know, again, this is an unprecedented time, but these measures are being put in place to protect the staff um, and making sure that you notify them of whatever those measures um, are. Unfortunately, there may be a time when you do have an employee that comes back with a COVID positive test, and then the question is, what do you do? Again, I go back to the CDC guidance. You want to have that printed out somewhere on your, your shelf. You can look at it as well as look on the website because, again, it's updated routinely. But the one thing you're going to make sure you want to do is sanitize sur uh, surfaces in the office, in your workstation, or in any area where that employee may have been. You want to make sure that you inform employees who had close contact, you know, within six feet, um, within 24, 48 hours of the symptom. But in doing that, again, you're not going to disclose the name of the individual, and you need to be careful about disclosing any other information that it would be uh, easy to identify who the person is. This may be difficult if you're a small office that has five to seven people, but you want to make sure that you keep those considerations into place when you are doing that. Have employees who have been in contact with the person self-quarantine at home. Hopefully, they can still telework if they're doing so, but you do want to allow them to self-quarantine. And again, check CDC and OSHA websites for any sort of new guidance um, on the matter. And I'm now going to turn it over to Jen, who's going to talk some more about documentation. So if any of you have ever attended a training that we've done, you'll know that we oftentimes hammer home the importance of documentation. And that is consistent here. We know that there will be lawsuits after COVID. And that doesn't mean every single employee or, you know, every um, visitor to a, a place is going to sue, but we're going to see it. We're already seeing class actions against colleges for things. Um, conferences being canceled, we're going to see workers' comp claims, and of course, people are going to claim issues with negligence. So people claiming that they got sick in the workplace. So how do we, what do we do to protect ourselves against that? 
And that's where you're going to get into the documentation. You have to document things. All of those things Peter talked about, the CDC guidance, the things that Tiffany went through with you on measures, your task force, document all of that now. Document that you have the task force, document the measures you're taking. If you end up testing um, for temperatures and doing all those things, maintain logs of all of that to show that you're doing everything that is possible to mitigate against um, an outbreak in your workplace. Um, document all of those efforts. That's really important. And then Tiffany talked about maintaining confidential confidentiality. So let's talk a little bit about Oliver. Oliver has been back at work and told you he tested positive. What are you going to tell the employees? Well, again, what Tiffany talked about is you need to have a plan at work for who gets the information, a clear reporting channel. You don't want 10 people being the recipient. So if you designate one or two people, those are the people who find out. And those are then the people who decide what communication goes out. And it's got to be confidential, but also allowing employees who would have been in contact with him within that six feet for a, a long enough time for exposure to take mitigating efforts. Again, the fewer people who know, the less likely this confidential information will get out. But you cannot disclose his name. And you want to refrain from using highly suggestive information that would make it clear who it is, like the person down two cubicles. Obviously, that's an issue. But you can, you do need to provide the information of it was an employee who was at work on Tuesday between these hours and who would have been in this area. And if they were in common areas, letting people know that. But the best idea is to have a script and to really stick with it. And if employees complain to you that you're not giving them enough information, just let them know that it's protected confidential information and that you can't provide it and that they would want the same um, benefit if they were in those shoes. So now what happens when we do get back and you want to stop remote working? Well, as an organization, you really do need to make the decision going forward. Not right now, but as we get closer, are we going to allow workers to continue to remote or are we going to go back to how we were doing it if we weren't allowing it initially? Um, in the past, employers did not think a lot of roles could be done remotely. But since going to COVID, we've been forced into this new environment where we're finding that people can do it. So have the floodgates been open? No, not necessarily. So again, as I talked about before, making sure that people understand that this is a temporary accommodation due to the pandemic and that positions are being allowed to be worked remotely only under as an emergency to allow the business operations to continue and to allow them to have job security as it's been going on. Again, documenting that it's temporary, but explaining to employees that not all industry and business operations can be sustained with remote working. Um, and so, and making, again, sure, documenting and being consistent in your communications with staff. So we're on our last hypothetical. Um, five employees at ABC are concerned um, about returning to work and have been very vocal about it. The Vocal Five sent a, member, a memo to leadership outlining their concerns with workplace conditions in light of COVID and their concerns with even coming back. Leadership did not respond within the 24 hours that they set as the false deadline, and the Vocal Five has now sent this memo to all employees. ABC has 30 employees and has been considering layoffs. Leadership proposes terminating the Vocal Five, particularly since they seem so concerned about returning to work. Any concerns with this? Yes, there are concerns. One law that we often think about as being really relating to unionized workers is the NLRA, the National Labor Relations Act. And so sometimes we forget that it applies to us. And what happened with their vocal five could be considered concerted activity, which is two or more employees complaining about workplace conditions. And so here you have the workplace five potentially complaining about the conditions at work and whether they're clean enough and the dangers to them this could be considered protected conduct. And we're gonna be seeing more of this now. So you need to be careful about retaliations claims. Since this is now protected activity, if ABC terminated the Vocal Five because of their hesitancy to come back to work, they could be laying the foundation for a retaliation claim. So just be mindful of when you have employees raising concerns, um, especially if it's two or more at once, this could be protected activity and tread carefully in how you respond. And when in doubt, consult counsel. Um, so now we're gonna turn it over to the Sump lawyer. I'm kicking it back to Peter to start with some of the questions we got. 
Um, and if you if you haven't submitted questions and you have them now, please feel free to do so. All right, thank you, Jen. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, we have a few questions here. I want to cover one asks about the executive order requiring retirement communities and nursing homes to test all staff members. Um, it appears that there, someone's making a distinction or asking if there's a distinction uh, within the staff as to those who are actually working with the elderly in the nursing home or those who are not. My understanding from uh, the executive order, and I haven't gone back to look at it, but my understanding was that it was universal and that it applies to all staff within the within the facilities and that it's actually being implemented by the state as they're they're increasing the testing, making the testing that's been available to them for testing all the nursing homes. Um, so that would be the answer to that. Um, another question asked, um, about using the term PPE and what does it mean? PPE generally doesn't refer to a cloth face covering. Uh, PPE would be referring to um, uh, something like an N95 respirator, uh, particular gloves and um, a suit covering that might protect an individual, particular boots. Um, it has a broader definition within OSHA as to specific gear that is required where there is a clear and express safety hazard. So PPE would be what you would imagine an emergency room physician might be wearing when they are dealing with a COVID-19 patient. It's not somebody wearing a mask, a face mask, and you don't necessarily, you shouldn't refer to a face mask as PPE. And if you looked at it, um, um, if you looked at it, then you would uh, you would back at the um, the um, presentation. You'll see that I was making a distinction there, and if it wasn't clear, I apologize. Um, there's also a question regarding self certification. I, I'm not. There's a number of different count, kinds of self certifications that are done. I'm not entirely clear what they're what the question is about, but um, in general, there's you know. Employees can certify as to their symptoms when they report to work, uh, providing information as to what whether they do or do not have symptoms and reporting any symptoms, which I have seen done on a daily basis in some cases. And in one case, I had a client required to do that by the State Department of Health. Um, and there's also uh, self-certification with respect to return to work um, from COVID-19 symptoms. However, I would suggest that you look to the CDC guidance on that issue, which talk, talks it actually was updated more recently, um, and uh, you would be looking to have a medical practitioner certify that to allow that person to return to work. Um, it wasn't not entirely clear to me what it means by doing it weekly or biweekly, um, at least in the context as I understand the question. Um, there is one question for the Oliver example, which I think, Jen, that was something you, you just read off, uh, or Tiffany. Yeah, that, um, I saw that. Do you and, want to answer that? Sure. And so this one was, um, the question was, in the Oliver example who tested positive, if he wants staff to know he tested positive, is that allowed? And my thinking is that it is fine, but I would make sure that that authorization is in writing. You'd really want a written waiver um, authorizing you to release that confidential information so that if he ever came back and challenged it, you'd have him saying, please let people know. I don't know if Tiffany or, or Peter have a difference of opinion on that, but that's what my recommendation would be. Um, I, I, I think that's accurate. I, I can tell you from the circumstances or from the situations where I've had this come up, everybody knows who the infected person is because they're not there at work and you're being told it's somebody you work near. And so it becomes a matter of common knowledge. Um, well, and they stop and, coming to work. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're not there. They stop coming to right. work. And so it, it is. It's, it, you know, it it it's really um, it's not something that you can mute. The question is, is whether you're the one spreading the information or whether the employees are doing it. As long as you're not the one distributing the information around, that's all well and good. Um, so. Um, 
There's another question is recommendations are for a task force with a small force staff of seven. Um, and there you are. Uh, pardon? I didn't know if you want me to take that, Peter. This is Tiffany. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. That's okay. Fine. Since I kind of talked about task force, I think with a small staff of seven, obviously it would be a little bit more difficult to establish the task force. And depending upon what your staff in your business look like, that's one where it would probably be the owner or the head of management or something of the business, maybe in conjunction with one other person coming up with whatever the policies or procedures are. And then that's one where I think you could just have an orientation with your all of your staff when they come back and talk all at once, or maybe it's just one person making the decisions. Um, but either way, there should still be one person to put some process into place so that you're not making it up as you go with a staff that small, but it may not be a large task force. And if I can add on to that, more, more important uh, to this is having a plan, putting something down in writing that you can refer to, update, and, and take action on, based on. Um, because uh, if if for whatever reason there are illnesses, and if for whatever reason you do get a visit from OSHA or from the State Department of Health, you're going to be asked what your plan is. What are you doing? What have you been doing? Where have you been doing it and for whom? And those agencies are going to be looking back at the CDC guidelines. And if you can show them, well, we put in we put in markers for social distancing. We put in markers for managing work and traffic flow in the office. We put in sanitation protocols and procedures. We have a uh, cleaning three times a day instead of once a day. We have workstations with uh, with sanitation materials such as hand wipes and sanitizer. You know, we we have uh, required face masks of all employees when they're out in common areas. We've closed our cafeteria for communal dining. Those are things that. If you can show that you put that into a plan and you're implementing it, you're going to have an easier time de dealing with regulatory bodies, number one, and two, convincing your employees that you're in a safe, safe work environment. And Peter, just to add on to what you said, which kind of covers, I think, one of the other questions you were about to address about whether employees should sign a document acknowledging receipt of the employer's procedures and policies regarding COVID. Um, as Peter just said, those agencies are going to come looking for whatever your plan and your process is. So I think it would be prudent when, if you do an orientation with your staff or however you disseminate the information to get some sort of acknowledgement that they received it. As Jen mentioned in her slide, we are always about documenting, documenting, documenting so that you have that. Who attended the orientation? Who got the policy? To make sure you do have part of a defense that this is what we did. They were there. They were present they knew they had the information. I think that's another good point um, that you do wanna have some sort of documentation. And then looking at a couple of other questions that have come in that are related. One was, if the employer chooses to institute mandatory temperature taking for all employees daily, what recommendations do you have for them to ensure that no applicable regulations laws are broken? Well, we've already heard from the EEOC that that's okay to do. And so um, if you're having them self-check and report it to you on a log, that's fine. Um, if you're having it done when they come in with something that, you know, isn't too invasive, um, you know, if you have one of the infrared ones or something like that, you would just do it on a log. I mean, we've gotten the okay from the EEOC to do that. And another question was, can we ask all staff to self-certify before we're returning to the office? when we physically reopen in place of temperature taking or COVID testing. And yes, you can. I mean, the issue with COVID testing is it's only good for that one snapshot. It doesn't mean the person isn't going to have it two days later. So you're not going to realistically be testing someone every day for COVID. But you can have a daily uh, certification where they have to click on a form or um, fill out a document. However, you're going to maintain that documentation that says they have no symptoms I think that's a better method than just doing the temperature checking anyway. As Peter had mentioned before, there are a lot more symptoms than just having a high temperature. And so that self-certification you can do weekly, you could do it daily. I would do it at least weekly if you're going to institute that. Um, and I don't think you're gonna fall afoul of any laws with that. And if I could just add one more thing on the temperature taking, keep in mind, temperature taking means there's somebody taking the temperature. And you're gonna have or that that person 
probably has been provided sufficient uh, equipment to protect them while they're doing it because depending on how they're taking a temp may be getting closer than within six feet of all of the individuals coming in and out of work. Right. Um, and this may yeah. sound a bit hypothetical, but I can tell you I are have that issue um, dealing with an individual who refuses to report to work because they've been put in danger of being told to take temperatures of people coming in and out of work. So um, keep that other point in mind. Yeah, I mean, one option, and we know some employers that have done that, is providing each of your staff with a thermometer. So they're responsible for doing it at home or when they get to the office. Um, do we have time to answer more, or do we, I mean, it's after 1 o'clock now. Why don't we go two more, and then we'll, anyone can follow up with any questions you might have to any one of our panelists. Okay, okay. So one it of the questions like is, oh, go ahead, Peter, go ahead. Is it, is it the one question about temporary remote work would be yours, Jen? Sorry, honey, I, sorry, I, it was, my sound was blocking off. What did you say, Peter? There's a temporary remote question. Does that, do you want to take, oh, take charge of yeah, that? Yeah, I can take a look at that. So if the temporary remote work arrangement lasts for substantial time, when does the primary place of employment change? And when would employment law change and state unemployment be affected? And that's really a great question. Um, and I mean, you're doing this as an accommodation because of COVID. And part of that's gonna depend on if, if you have employees where we are in DMV, they could be anywhere. Um, and actually, I, I, I'm, you stumped this lawyer. I think we'd have to look into that to see which law would apply. Typically in the remote, if they're working in a different state, those laws would apply. So you're going to want to make sure you're complying with everything. Um, I'd be surprised if if we all of a sudden started making um, employers on the fly have to comply with things when it's not really, I mean, you've got the Office of Human Rights. You're always going to need to comply with that. But now you're right. You could be subject to jurisdiction in other states where you're not located, which is a danger with remote employees. Uh, Tiffany, Peter, do you have anything to add to that? I, no, I, I agree with you. I, I think it's probably going to be a matter of right now, it, it, it would probably be both jurisdictions where they're temporarily working from home if it's different from where the actual physical office location is. Um, now, that's something, again, a lot of the laws are changing, and some of the agencies that enforce these laws will issue guidance um, with some sort of maybe temporary restrictions due to COVID or something else. But I think right now you'd have to assume that you have to operate under both laws. Now, does that mean that you need to go out and get unemployment insurance or something else in a location where somebody is temporarily working from home? Maybe not right now, but it is a question that we should monitor for the future, depending upon how long the person is going to be working from home. Okay. And yeah, and like this, a, yeah, go ahead, Peter. Yeah, there's one, um, there's one uh, last question I think we ought to hear because we're going past about best practice for keeping the records of daily self-certification. Um, Generally, you, somebody within HR is going to be responsible for maintaining the confidentiality of medical records that employees have. Um, those should, uh, per, pursuant to federal law, be kept separate and apart from personnel files. Um, the recommendation would be that you maintain any of your certification logs or self-reporting logs that employees present to you or information that's been obtained in connection with COVID inquiries. Um, in a similar location so that they're maintained confidentially and not generally available and, and out there for, um, for uh, somebody to stumble upon and, and then have access to that information. Um, I think there's one other question that I think it looked at, the one about state law has been answered, but looking to hire an HR consultant, I think the you ought to do as an employer, even as a small employer, is take a look at the information that's there and make an assessment as to whether it's these are things that you think you can manage on your own and develop a plan. And then if you feel that you're still in need of guidance, you can either seek counsel to review your plan or you could get an HR consultant to do the same. Having them come in and do an additional top to bottom review 
development of a process and plan for you may be quite expensive for a small business, whereas that might be something more manageable for a larger business who's looking to do it, um, uh, facilities engineering for, for their plan. So um, I think there, there are just a lot of resources out there educating yourself in advance by looking at the OSHA guidelines, the CDC guidelines, any guidelines issued by your State Department of Health, knowing what they are, knowing what your state emergency executive orders say, and having that information in hand and using it to develop some steps that you at will go to great lengths to reducing the cost if you do feel you need to get a professional. Okay. All right, I don't see anything else. Jen, Tiffany, anything else you'd add at the end? No, the only thing I would add is that uh, Peter has reiterated, Jen and I, that again, continue to go to the CDC and OSHA websites for guidance and just know that as, the, as we learn more about the virus, um, a lot of the laws are continuing to change. Um, so when in doubt, if you have questions, reach out to legal counsel, go to those websites, or if appropriate, you know, consult the other appropriate professional. Right, and that's really important to know that even the guidance that the EEOC is issuing changes. And so just being on top of it and checking it, just knowing that just because you looked at it last week doesn't mean it's not changing next week. So consistently check it. Excellent, and thank you, Peter and Jen and Tiffany, and thanks for everyone for attending today's webinar, The Work Landscape During COVID-19, What Does Normality Resemble? As previously mentioned, you will receive a follow-up email within 24 hours with a link to view the recording of today's webinar and a copy of the presentation. On behalf of Whiteford, Taylor, and Preston and our presenters today, thanks for joining us and stay well.